All right, antibiotics and surgery. Um, in the ASU, um, we treat a lot of skin conditions and we treat a lot of abdominal conditions in particular. In terms of skin conditions, we see cellulitis commonly. So Jose, um, if someone's got a red inflamed lower limb, think they've got cellulitis, what are the likely organisms and what would you prescribe? Um, likely organisms are Staphylococcus. Yep, or strep. Yep. Good. Epidem epididymis. Epididymis. Epidermidis, maybe? Epidermidis, yep. Um, um, yeah, so I would treat with uh, Pilpoxacin. So yep. ID. Okay. What else can you give? Clindamycin is another option. Okay, so flu clocks, what does flu clocks cover? Staph. Yeah, gram positive. What else can you use if they're allergic to flu clocks or penicillins? Actually, before we go to that, what's an alternative to flu clocks that's also a penicillin? Dicloxacillin? Does it really matter? I don't know. One's supposed to cause hepatitis and one's supposed to cause, you know, renal fibrosis. Choose your poison. Some, any, anything else? If they're allergic to penicillins? Clindamycin. Yeah, you could give clindamycin, but what, what do we often give before we get to clindamycin? Yeah. Kefazolin. And what class of medication is kefazolin? Jennifer? Yep. And? Fourth generation. No, not fourth generation. Okay. Sorry? Second generation? No. No. So we're left, we're, it's not fourth, third, or second, so it's first. first, first yeah. No, it's a first, first generation of An oral form of kefazolin is, yeah, which is kefalothin. Um, yep, so there are things you can give. Now, if you've got a type one hypersensitivity to penicillin, um, what do you use there, William? So you can use clindamycin, I guess, because that's not a penicillin and other things you might be forced to use are... Uh... Yeah, Sipo can cover some gram positives or a bunch of you. I mean, bank's always an option. You don't want to have to go down to bank if you don't need to, but yeah, clindamycin is a good option there. Um, if you've got a type 1 hypersensitivity, or if they're allergic to both of them. All right, now, what if you've got So you've got a diabetic now with uh, you know, a red inflamed lower leg and foot. What's the additional concern there? Yeah. Anything else? The renal failure. Yeah, and more in terms of microorganisms. Polymicrobial. Yeah, polymicrobial. Why is that? Because they're not things that impair their immune system as well as um, increased risk of infection secondary to hyperglycemia. Yeah. Region. Yeah, so you've got localised hypoglycemia in the tissues, you've got different perfusion physiology there, you know, you've got you know, microvascular disease so that the perfusion of oxygen into the tissues isn't as well, the removal of waste products from the tissue doesn't work as well. So um, you get, you're more likely to get a polymicrobial synergistic type infection. So you have to worry about everything. You have to worry about gram positives, gram negatives and anaerobes. And so um, if you're worried about a diabetic foot infection, what do the antibiotic guidelines say there? Yeah. And what does that cover? Sorry. Yes, good moment. What else? Gram positive. Yeah, gram positive. What else? Yeah, it's got good anaerobic cover. What else? Beta lactamase resistant. Yeah. I don't know exactly. Oh, that's really you have to ask Dr. Kim with that. Um, but as a class of, as a class, but yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an extended spectrum uh, 
Canada's film because it's got um, it's got um, Caprice and it has a background and like Augmenton or like Tymenton, it broadens the penicillin colour to include. So we've got that and that. What else? Yeah, Grand Mary Yeah, Grand Mary So that's why, you know, in a diabetic with a soft tissue infection, we want to cover all these things now. We don't just want to cover Grand Positives. And that's something to think about wherever the soft tissue infection is. Um, there are guidelines specifically for diabetic B infection, um, but um, anywhere a diabetic has a soft tissue infection, uh, certainly give that a thought, particularly if they're not getting better. So I've seen a lot of treatment failures in diabetics due to just giving flu cops. Uh, so certainly keep this in mind. So, that's skin and soft tissue largely. In the abdomen, um, what types of things do we have to worry about? Say if we're talking about diabetes diverticulitis. Yeah, anaerobes and grain movies. Anything else? How are you? What type of organism is Entrococcus? No, no. It's a, a coccus suggests it's circular. So it's actually a gram positive organism. And it's a cocci as opposed to a lot of most gram negatives are a rod shaped. And which particular species of um, organism are we concerned about today? Right? Entrococcus, which is sensitive to Gwyneth. Leo, William, yeah, I'm still on. yeah. So what things cover Entrococcus? Ampicillin, what else? No, the Kephosporins generally don't cover Entrococcus. Bank will cover And I'd say the extended spectrum penicillins will also cover it as well. The Kephlosporins, um, certainly up to the third generation, including Keftriaxone, won't cover Entrococcus. Mm. That's, that's something to keep in mind. The main things are these two things. So would the antibiotic guidelines recommend um, if you've got diverticulitis to cover ideally all three, but mainly those two to start off with? Mm. What's the old-fashioned regime? Yeah, and gen. So the gent obviously covers this. The metronidazole covers that. And the ampicillin is supposed to cover this. If you have a penicillin allergy, what do the guidelines recommend? Keptriaxone. Yeah, keptriaxone and labrum. Now note that if you substitute Keptriaxone for Genomycin, you won't get entrococcal cover. But the guidelines feel that um, uh, the risk is small enough that at least in the initial setting, you don't need to specifically cover for that um, if you've got a penicillin allergy. But uh, if you need to cover it for that and have got a penicillin allergy, then obviously you can move to a bank. Or if They've got specific enterococcal resistance to ampicillin, then you might have to move to bank anyway. All right. Now, in terms of intra abdominally, what we give to the diverticulitis is very similar to what we give to other conditions in the abdomen. Acute cholecystitis, what's the guidelines there? Metronidazole? Yeah, look, you're right. I, I, 
the guidelines sort of change a little bit from time to time, but generally, if, if it's your first attack, they generally recommend that you don't necessarily have to cover for anaerobes, so just ampicillin and genomycin or keptrixin alone. Um, but if there's, if, if you're worried about complications, perhaps if they're diabetic, certainly if they've had their bile duct instrumented in any way, ERCP, or they've previously had a perk drain or something like that, then you certainly need to add metronidazole. Um, but um, uh, if, it's, if it's a fairly simple uh, cholecystitis, and if, certainly if it's the first episode of cholecystitis, the guidelines generally just say um, gram negatives and ampicillin. So metronidazole is good. Cool. I'm oh, sorry, I've got people mixed up. Yeah, yeah. metronidazole is for the anaerobes, and the jet is for the ground Thanks for picking that. Other than gent and extended broad spectrum penicillin, what, what else gives good drain relief cover? And it's also good orally. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks only for that. Cipro? So, um, other intra abdominal catastrophes like perforated peptic ulcer disease. What do you give there? Leo. Bueno. Well. Well, you just need to cover for this stuff again. So you can use Amgen Slagel, uh, you can use the broad spectrum um, penicillin. Generally, people want to save those for pseudomonal infections, so they generally recommend that. UTIs? What do we treat UTIs with? Yeah. And what are things generally work with UTIs? Yeah, most of the simpler antibiotics work with UTI. Obviously, to get a specific sensitivity for the UTI you're treating. Um, the trimethoprim, uh, ampicillin, uh, first generation keplosporin would generally work. And then if you get a specific sensitivity that says the ampicillin doesn't work and you need to go to Augmentin or a third generation Keplosporin, you can do that. So, um, generally, what do first generation Keplosporins treat? Um, yep. So first generation, first generation. Uh, Gram positive with a little bit of gram negative cover. What is second generation treat? We don't really have them in this hospital. But sometimes they're quite useful. They're generally good at um, anaerobes. And they have some gram positive and gram negative cover. What do third generations treat? Negative. Yeah, gram negative. And they have a little bit of gram positive cover, but largely gram negative. Fourth generations, Keplosporins, are extended spectrum to cover pseudomonas. All right, now, the reason why I bring that up is because in terms of uh, prophylaxis, when we're doing an operation on the skin, for example, um, if it's a simple skin operation, you don't need any prophylaxis at all. You just need to sterile prep and drain. But if you're doing a hernia operation and you want to give prophylaxis for the implanting mesh, what do you generally give for prophylaxis there? Yeah, and it's largely for the gram positive um, prophylactic effect. Okay. In um, intra-abdominal surgery, if you're doing a gallbladder or an appendix, um, what prophylaxis do we generally give? Keptrixin. Yeah, I generally want to cover gram negative and 
anaerobes. And I'm generally happy that the small amount of granular cover plus metronidazole is good enough in a prophylactic sense for an appendix or a gallbladder. If you know the appendix is perforated and there's widespread contamination, I probably would, in addition to that, add a proper gram granulative cover such as Gent or Keftriaxone. But if it's purely prophylaxis, I'm happy with a first gen Keftosporin plus an anode. Um, the good thing about second generation uh, Keftosporin is that they, they have a reasonable anaerobic cover. And in hospitals that have it, that's a perfectly reasonable option for prophylaxis in intra-abdominal surgery. And it's a single agent, and you only have to give one agent. The nieces don't have to grow up fragile as well as um, a first generation KEF. But we don't have it here, so you know, we don't use it. But in hospitals that have it, that's where you use your second generation for prophylaxis in intra-abdominal surgery. And I think that's about it. Phil, any questions or queries? Um, pneumonias that get associated with our patients, hospital acquired um, aspiration pneumonia, uh, you generally treat using this type of regime. Obviously the community acquired pneumonias, um, uh, that's more medical, uh, the, the medical regime for that is different, but where you have aspiration pneumonia, you generally treat with this regime because the bugs you know, obviously are coming from the gut. Okay. And that's something you might see on the ASU. People who have a laparotomy, if they get atelectasis, is that isn't well treated, or if they end up with pneumonia. Um, this is the type of regime that will be used to treat that. Any other questions, queries, or?